Okay, inorganic chemistry, uh, naming complexes. This is part three of our um, sort of foray into coordination chemistry, uh, where we've been looking at um, ligand, what ligands are in the first part, and then we've now moved. Then we uh, we're now moving on to sort of like, well, how do we name these things? Like they have all these different ligands. What's the order of the name? How does a name relate to a structure? Um, and things like that. So. Uh, in this part, we will be looking at the nomenclature of complexes and writing formulae. Um, so like if it has a certain composition of ligands, how does that translate into its name? Um, and then like this means that you're going to be expected to relate the structure diagram to the formula uh, to the written name and back again. Uh, so like there will be um, of course, like the names are going to be descriptive. And so they're going to give you a basis for what you're going to then draw. And then once you've like drawn out the structure, you can also relate that back to the original name. So in writing the formula, we place the metal atom first, then add the ligands in alphabetical order, then the inner sphere complex is enclosed in square brackets. Um, and then for ionic complexes, the cation and anion are separated with the cation in first, so it kind of goes like this. So like some complexes, a lot of the complexes we come across are positively charged, which means that they need to have a counter ion, which is the outer sphere ion. It's not actually bound to the complex. Uh, it's not actually data covalently bonded to the metal, but it is uh, important that uh, it is there because otherwise we would have a charge imbalance and um, things would react until such times as that charge imbalance was rectified. Now, um, if, the, however, the complex is negatively charged, it is itself an anion, then the counter ion needs to be positive, and that will be a cation. So cation will be first, then complex, then anion. Um, so we can see some examples of this. So we have here this complex here, this um, diamino dichloro uh, platinum complex. So um, we all this is a neutral complex, but what happens if we have an anionic complex, then we're going to need positively charged uh, counter ion. So that could be potassium, could also be things like sodium. Really, it can be anything, um, so long as it's positively charged. And so long as all of the charges bounce. So in this case, it's potassium, which is quite a common one. Um, this potassium, then it is going to be our counter ion. And then our um, platinum complex here is negatively charged. So it's um, going to be a platinate, but we'll learn about how to name those things in a little while. So it's a Platinate um, two, uh, and then what happens if it's positively charged? Then we need an anionic counter ion, so that would be this tetra ammonia, a tetra ammonio, ammonium uh, platinum two, um, and then the chloride anion is acting as our counter ion again. Same thing, could have had bromides, could have really had anything so long as it's negatively charged, and the charges between the negative and the positively charged things bounce. Uh, isomers then are indicated by an abbreviated descriptor in front of the complex in italics. So yes, so obviously like um, whenever we write these things down, there are different ways to arrange them. Now, maybe not so much in the, this case and this case, since the ligands are all the same, it doesn't really matter how we arrange them, it's all gonna be the same. But in this complex, we can have different arrangements. We can have arrangements where the um, two of the same ligand are beside each other, or they could be opposite each other. So we could have cis and trans isomerism. So that's going to be indicated in the name. So here we have our um, platinum complex. So whenever they're beside each other, we have cis complex. And whenever they're opposite each other, we have a trans complex. It traverses the, um, the, the method. So then bridging ligands are indicated by a, a mu, a Greek letter mu. So uh, this is not U, but uh, mu. And so this uh, indicates that the ligand is shared between two metal centers. So like, for example, here, um, the chlorine is bridging between the two platinum metals. Here we have an oxygen and here we have an am amide. Uh, they are both bridging between the cobalts. And then here we have this uh, pyrazine, which is bridging between the iron on either side like so. So the way that those would be named, like obviously it's very obvious from the way that they are drawn out, what's going on. 
but it's less obvious if I write it down on a page, you might not uh, immediately understand what's going on. So there's two ways to write it out here. There's um, both of them, however, involve the mu in front of the chlorine uh, as the ligand. And that mu indicates that it bridges between two metal centers. Uh, the same thing here, um, obviously with the imide and we have the oxygen, so they both uh, are given the letter mu and they bridge like so. Um, and then here we have the pyrazine, uh, it is bridging between the two iron centers. Okay, so there's some rules that can guide us in how we go about naming these things. So the ligands are given first, followed by the metal. And the names of the complex cations and neutral molecules have the normal spelling of the metal. So the name of complex anions end in eight. So if it's a positively charged complex, then it just is the regular metal name. So like, for example, uh, earlier we had platinum, uh, we had like, what was that? Um, tetraamino platinum two. Um, so that's just platinum. Um, but in the case of the, the one that had the four Chloro ligands, that was tetrachloroplatin eight. The eight indicates that the complex is in fact anionic. So ligands are placed in alphabetical order as in the written formula. So um, we place them like, uh, yeah, based so, like for example, uh, amino ligands come before chloro ligands um, or uh, ammonia ligands come before chloro ligands because uh, even though N is after C in the alphabet, in the name, uh, it's called ammonia. So that's A, so that goes first. Um, so, so most uh, anionic ligands end in O, um, and all neutral ligands are spent, not neural, neutral ligands are spelled as normal, except for, um, for example, water, uh, which is called aqua, uh, ammonia, which is called amine, with, with two Ms, uh, and then uh, CO, which is the carbon monoxide, is called carbona. So these are the three that changed their names. Um, so it's not ammonia ligand, it's not um, carbon monoxide ligand, it's carbonyl ligand, amine ligand, and aqua ligand. Although sometimes you hear people saying water as a ligand. Um, but usually like written in the like IUPAC style names, that should definitely be aqua. So the number of ligands is shown by the prefixes mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, uh, and so on. And these are used without hyphens unless uh, one of these violations happens. If the ligand itself includes such a prefix, the number of ligands is donated by bis, tris, tetricus, hexicus, for example, and the ligand is bracketed. So there are some um, ligands which already have mono or di or tri, written in them in their names and so it doesn't make sense to say try try so what we say we say tris try or something like that um, then a bridging ligand is separated by the name by hyphens and is prefixed with the mu so that's where we have a hyphen between the the preceding ligand and the uh, actual bridging ligand the oxidation state of the metal is usually indicated by a roman numeral after the metal so like a one or two or three whatever it happens to be um so here are some examples um, of how we sort of like write out that um formula so here we have the nickel and uh, the metal goes first then we have the water ligands the aqua ligands and then after that we have the counter ion which balances everything here we have carbonyl ligands um we have the cyano ligands and so on so uh, this uh, hexa aqua nickel um, two chloride. So hexa aqua nickel two dichloride. You don't actually necessarily need to always have the dichloride since, or the di here in front of the chloride because it's usually implied whenever we know the charge of the complex. So you would need to have two chlorides in order to balance the plus two charge on the nickel. So it's hexa aqua hexa because there are six um, water ligands and aqua because that's the name for water and then it's nickel. So the name didn't change because it's positively charged this complex. And then it's nickel too. Um, I was able to work that out without seeing the name because th this was the correct formula then. I know that chlorine ligands or chloride uh, ions are pretty much always minus one. So that would mean that if there's two of them, that means it's gonna be uh, minus two. And then over here in the nickel, I know that water is a neutral molecule, so this is a neutral ligand, so that means that any positive charge must come from the nickel. In this case, we have what well, here, uh, we call it tripotassium, I suppose, or just potassium, 
And then the next part would be uh, describing the complex. So it would be hexacyanoferrate, uh, um, what's that, ferrate three. Um, so in this case, it's iron three because cyano ligands are minus uh, one each. So that's going to be minus six in total. Um, plus three gives us uh, minus three in total for this complex. And then we balance that with this potassium. There are three of them. And so that would mean that we would end up with uh, a neutral complex. So by combining my knowledge, the potassium is pretty much always plus one and the cyan cyanoligands are pretty much always minus one. I can work out the oxidation state of the iron. So there we go. So try potassium. Now this try, this dye, they're not necessarily totally required in this written name. Um, but sometimes good practice to include it. Um, okay, so here we have a cobalt complex. Um, so we've got uh, a single chloride out here as an outer sphere ligand, which is uh, just charge balancing really. And then um, in the inner sphere inside of the square brackets, we have our metal, which is cobalt. We have two chloro ligands, uh, which have then minus one charge. And we have two uh, diamine ligands. Um, or one, two diethylene ligands. Um, so that's a neutral ligand, that's a bidentate ligand. And then these are two negatively charged ligands. Um, so we have dichloro bis ethylene diamine, cobalt three chloride. So dichloro because it's got the two chlorides. Um, then a bis is, it's given bis, it's not diethylene diamine because there's a di already in that um, part here. Um, so we can't use di di, so we have to use bis. This is an instance when we use bis instead of di, and then we have cobalt three, and then we have chloride out on the outside to balance the charge. Then we have here a platinum complex. We have a platinum positively charged complex and a platinum negatively charged complex. So this is a case of where the counter ion is in fact a um, complex itself. It depends which way you look at it, which one is the counter ion. But basically, they charge balance each other in such a way that we end up with. Um, a neutral complex. Now, in this case, it's actually quite difficult for me to find out what the oxidation state of platinum metal would be um, because um, I don't have, like, I don't know exactly what the oxidation state of platinum is on this in the anion. I don't know what the oxidation state of the metal is in this one. So I'm going to need the metal. I'm going to need the name to help me. So uh, here it is tetra. I mean, dichloroplatinum four. So that means this is going to be plus two charge. Why is it plus two charge? Well, because we've got this dichloro and we've got this four oxidation state. So this is plus four, this is minus two. So that becomes plus two. And then this tetrachloroplatinate two. So this is plus two. And then this is minus four becomes minus two. So this part is minus two and this part is plus two. So plus two. And then this one is minus two. Okay. Uh, then the last cobalt complex here, um, we have uh, eight water ligands. We have two, that should be a mu. I don't know what has happened here. Uh, it should be mu. Um, so bridging hydroxides and then our uh, charge balancing ligand is going to be the um, sulfate. So there's two cobalts in this complex, which means that they're, they're both bridged by this um, is hydroxide. So it's uh, octa aqua M, so it should be mu, sorry, a dihydroxo dicobalt three disulfate. And then this one is going to be tetracarbonyl nickel zero. Nickel zero because the carbonyl, um, they have no charge, so their charge is zero. And then nickel, uh, since it's a neutral complex, there's no counter ion. The nickel must also have an oxidation state of zero. So it's tetracarbonyl nickel zero. Okay, so the next step would be then to draw out some examples of the structural formula. So um, I'll do the first one maybe and then uh, let you have a, a go at the others in your own time, um, just as practice. So uh, the first one then is tri-aqua, tri-hydroxo chromium. So chromium three. So um, 
this is going to be a neutral complex because aqua ligands, water ligands, they're neutral molecules. There's three hydroxyl ligands, which are negatively charged. Um, and the chromium is um, plus three. So plus three and then minus three creates a neutral complex. So um, we would have our methyl chromium. We're assu I'm assuming it's, well, I don't know actually exactly its isomerism. Um, uh, so I can draw it. Sort of in two forms, like I could draw it out just like this. Uh, um, so, what are they going to hear? Here, and then the hydroxide is going to be here. So, this is just like Drawing out the structure, and then um, another way to do it could be, for example, just um, literally putting the chromium hydroxide like that. Name the following. Oh, okay. So then you've got other ones here, like um, cis ethylene diamine tetra aqua iron. So the ethylene diamine is going to be a kind of a, a bidentate ligand, and they've got four waters. So um, the cis indicates that the ethylene diamine um, nitrogens are beside each other. Then you've got sodium dioxalate of cuprate, too. You've got dibromo bis uh, triphenylene phosphine. Cobalt, um, this M should be bridging. This M here should also be bridging. Okay, so then we want to try and name complexes. So like, for example, um, we have uh, this complex here, this iridium complex, we've got two bridging chlorides, we've got um, our carbon ligands, and we've got our um, biphenyl, this, this one ten, I think, um, or one twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, biphenyl. And then we've got this one, which is the molybdenum complex. So this is going to be a facial carbonyl and facial um, triphenyl phosphine. Um, then we've got over here a palladium complex, we've got thiocyanate, we've got our um, ethylene diamine, we've got four thiocyanate, sorry, and our ethylene diamine, which is cis, so the two ligands are sort of beside each other in the same plane. Then we've got the um, other positions filled with the thiocyanates and the palladium. Then we've got here our iron, uh, our pentacarbonyl iron complex. Isomerism in methyl complexes. So geometrical isomerism. So different spatial arrangements of ligands in a complex. So we've got square planar complexes. So the examples of these, like great examples of um, square planar complexes are going to be platinum complexes. Um, they're probably the most well-known. Um, one of the most well-known would be this uh, cis platinum, um, where we have uh, two amino ligands and two chloro ligands. So that's a common um, anti-cancer drug. It's uh, pretty much always included in the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines for all countries. Um, a very important drug. Uh, but interestingly, the trans variant doesn't actually do anything in terms of um, anti-cancer activity. Um, and so that can show us the importance of isomerism. So a geometrical isomerism is different spatial arrangement of ligands in a complex. So square planar complexes, we have the M A2, B2. So we have two ligands and we have two of each. Uh, we can have two different ways of uh, arranging them geometrically. Um, one is where they're beside each other and then one is where they're opposite each other. When they're beside each other, that's going to be cis. And when they're opposite each other, that's going to be trans. Uh, octahedral complexes then. So again, if we have an arrangement of uh, two A ligands, so two of the same type and then four of a different type, 
uh, we can have um, two types of isomerism, uh, cis and trans for geometrical isomerism. Then if we have, um, so cis is obviously where the two A's are beside each other and trans is where they're opposite each other. And then we just fill in the B's where they need to go. Octahedral then uh, where we have three and three as our ligand uh, distribution. Um, we can have two different isomerisms as well, a geometrical isomerism. So one is a uh, fact or facial. Um, so what happens here is that they are uh, all on the same face. Um, so if I can kind of like connect them up, it might seem to make them more obvious. So uh, these are in the same face there, and then these are in the same face here. Whereas meridionally, we're talking like this, and then this. So they're on the same plane. Uh, this is meridional, and this is uh, facial. So it's a different way of drawing it out. So they're all in the same face of the uh, complex. Second type of isomerism is optical isomerism. So this is um, where we're starting to like consider things like uh, symmetry and whatnot. So when there is no plane of symmetry in a complex, isomerisms, isom isomers arise, uh, which are non-superimposable mirror images of another. So they're basically chiral. Um, so it's especially common in, in tetrahedral complexes. So it's very similar to uh, carbon chemistry. So if we've got a tetrahedral complex and we've got four different ligands, then we can definitely have optical isomerism. So you can see here that there's two um, different types um, where they're non-superimposable mirror images. If you try to set this one uh, on the right on top of this one on the left, you will find that the, it is impossible no matter what you do to rotate it or whatever. There's no way that they can be superimposed on each other. Uh, two isomers of Manganese complex where we've got four different ligands. We've got a carbonyl ligand, we've got a nitrosyl ligand, we've got a triphenyl uh, phosphine ligand, and we've got um, a cyclopentene uh, ligand are going to be uh, separable. So uh, this is because um, they have four different types of ligands, maybe A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D, we just range them, then two of the uh, isomers are going to be very different. And so it's going to be possible to separate them. Another type is, the second type here is going to be the tetrahedral, uh, where we have um, two bidentate ligands, um, but the, the different um, the attachment sites are different. So uh, in this case, we have, so like, for example, in one case, it attaches with one nitrogen and one oxygen, which is the case in glycinate, um, which is an amino acid. So A could be nitrogen, B could be oxygen. And then depending on how they attach, um, you get different isomers. So you can see a mirror image of this is non-superimposable on the original. Of course, not all complexes are tetrahedral. In fact, very few, well, not very few. Um, the majority of complexes are going to be octahedral. Um, so in principle, there are many octahedral complexes which contain optical isomers such as MA2B2C2. Uh, we also have MA2BCDE. We also have MABCDEF. There are six different ligands. Uh, the most common species usually include chelates. So for example, uh, we have here the is chromium uh, diethylene uh, or ethylene diamine ligand. Um, we have two isomers here. Uh, AA indicates that the attachment um, point is going to be the same kind of uh, element. So it's both nitrogen in, in both cases. Um, through obviously the lone pair and the nitrogen, we have here a lambda and delta isomers. So lambda isomers are typically going to rotate anti-clockwise through space. And then um, delta isomers rotate clockwise through space. Um, so lambda is sort of anti-clockwise left and delta is, is right. So, so how that rotates is, is anti-clockwise through space and how this rotates is clockwise through space. 
So you can see here like this ligand, it will pass over here, and then this one will pass here, and then this one will pass there, and so on in a, in a sort of a rotational manner. Um, like if I draw a line through here and rotate it that way, then this will move to here and this will move to there. Uh, same if I do it here on this side. So if I draw a line through here and rotate it around, then what I'm going to see is that this um, ligand becomes this ligand and this ligand becomes that ligand. Uh, other examples, so you can necessarily need to have just by by or chelating ligands or multiple dentate ligands. Um, you can also have a some multiple dentate ligands like this uh, biphenyl, and then you can also have uh, regular sort of monodentate ligands, like um, the, the chloro ligands here. So here are um, a couple of complexes. So we've got um, a cobalt complex with ethylene diamine ligands, and we've got a cobalt complex with oxalate ligands. So um, here we have the uh, delta uh, sort of uh, clockwise rotation um, complex, and here we have the lambda anti-clockwise uh, rotation uh, complex. So what happens here is that this nitrogen rotates around to here, and this one rotates around to here, um, and so on in anti-clockwise manner. Um, it can, it's kind of a bit hard to see in paper. It's easier if you've got a chemistry model or a model you can make a complex, and you can just sort of, if you rotate it around, you'll see that um, through it'll rotate through space in a certain, a certain manner. Um, Then at the bottom here, we have um, just an example of how you can use different ligands and still get the same sort of complexes so long as their, their binding is similar. So uh, diethyl, or ethylene diamine binds through the nitrogens and uh, oxalate uh, binds through the oxygens. Um, so here again, the delta is going to be going clockwise through space, and the lambda is going to be going anti-clockwise through space. Um, so you can see here, if you look at the top ligand, it passes to the left, and that's a general anti-clockwise direction. This top ligand here passes to in an anti-clockwise direction as well, and then this one passes in anti-clockwise direction. Whereas if I draw a line from this nitrogen to this nitrogen, it's going in a clockwise direction. This nitrogen to this nitrogen, it's going in a clockwise direction. This nitrogen to this nitrogen underneath, clockwise direction. And so that's how you follow it. You, you rotate it so it's not like this, but rather you have three ligands pointing towards you. For octahedral complexes, this is. You have three ligands pointing towards you, and then you look to see how they bind or how they are connected to the other um, binding site in the same um, ligand. So here it's going, it's going, it's going clockwise in each case, uh, which means that this is delta, this is also delta, and then these are both going to be lambda. Okay, um, ionization isomerism then. So this is where we have the same overall composition, but we have made up of different ions. So how does that work? And um, basically it means that there's been some sort of an exchange between inner and outer sphere ligands. Like for example, there could be ligands which are um, coordinated directly to the metal, and then in one isom isomer, and then in the other, they're the sort of counter ion. Uh, so here uh, we have a cobalt complex, which in this instance has chloro and amino ligands or amine ligands attached to it. And then the counter ion is this uh, nitrate ligand. Um, then we could do, we could bring it inside this, the, the counter ion here, bring it inside and make it an inner sphere ligand attached to the cobalt. And um, then use the, uh, what do you call it? The chloride as the, or the chloro ligand that was attached here as a chloride counter ion. Then uh, in this case, we've got a similar thing. We've got a cobalt complex um, where the counter ion is this thiocyanate. Um, and the inner sphere ligands are the nitrosal, the uh, ethylene diamine, and the chloroline. So there are many different options to do here. Basically, the only one which cannot be moved outside in this instance 
is the ethylene diamine, and that's because it's a neutral ligand, and so it can't actually act as a, a you know a, a charge balancer. So these are the different possibilities, and then here we've got a platinum complex where we've got um, a chloral ligand and then an amino ligands inside, and bromide ligand or bromide ions as the kind of counter ion. And then we have uh, on the other side, we brought the platinum, or sorry, sorry, brought the bromide inside and moved the chloride out. So uh, hydration isomerism. So these are where like waters of crystallization um, can displace ligands um, or vice versa. So this uh, chromium chloride uh, complex has six waters of crystallization. So that's what that dot means. So this basically just means it never forms a crystal. There's going to be six waters inside of that crystal structure for every uh, chromium uh, chloride that we have. So ligated water is displaced to become water of crystallization. So um, here we have a hexa aqua chromium three, um, and then the three chlorides outside. So all of the chlorides can be precipitated out. So that's a violet complex. Um, here we see that there is some um, switching. So the chloride goes inside uh, to the inner sphere and that kicks out a water of crystallization. And so that then is a green um, complex. And then only two of the chlorides that can be precipitated out. Then we have ligand isomerism. So this isomerism rises from the ligand. So some ligands um, have different, uh, so same clear of like, number of different atoms or whatever, so same like uh, atomic formula, whatever, but different um, structures. So for example, this, this ligand here, um, kind of a structure wherein it is uh, one three diaminopropane, so the nitrogen um, can be on either end, or it can be one two diaminopropane, where one of the, um, what do you call us? One of the methanes is no longer in the chain, but is instead um, going to be like branched. Linkage isomerism then arises when a ligand can coordinate by either one of two sites. So the most common ones for this are the nitrite ligand, um, nitro and nitrito. Uh, so if it is going to, um, bind through the nitrogen, it's going to be nitro. If it's going to bind through the oxygen, it's nitrito. Um, so we just draw that out slightly differently. So it's NO2 if it's nitrogen bound, and it's ONO if it's oxygen bound. Uh, thiocyanate is also a, a good example of uh, linkage isomerism. So it can bind through the sulfur or through the nitrogen, just really depends on which metal it is. So um, we'll really see why this happens. Um, a little bit later, whenever we look in depth at how hard soft acid base theory uh, impacts uh, coordination complexes. Um, but basically one of these is softer than the other. And so it is going to like the softer um, ion is going to preferentially bind to softer metals and then the nitrogen being slightly harder will bind to the harder metals. So we write it two different ways. So S first, if S is the one that's going to be um, bound to the metal, it'll be thiocyanato. Um, and then here where nitrogen is the binding atom, that would be isothiocyanato. Uh, then coordination isomerism. So when both the ligand or both the cation and anion of a salt are complexes, the distributions of the ligands between the two can vary. So this is where you know it sort of jumps from one to the other. So here we have a hexa amino cobalt complex, and here we have a hexa cyano chromium or chromate complex. And so uh, we could actually swap the metals around and still have on paper the same number of atoms of each type, but we have two very different complexes. And then the same thing down here, we've seen a swap. So here we've got two pure metal complexes, and here we've got two mixed metal complexes. So let's take a look at some examples. So uh, let's try and draw the geometric isomers of the octahedral complex manganese, um, the, the aqua the di, uh, uh, dioxalato manganese two minus four minus two 
complex. So we've got the trans, uh, we've got the our bidentate ligand um, opposite each other. And so that's the trans complex where the water uh, ligands are opposite each other. So they're trans to each other. And then we've got the cis version, but whenever the cis isomer is formed, we can have um, a rotational isomerism. So we can also have uh, or the optical isomerism of um, lambda and delta. So this is the lambda isomer. Lambda is an anti-clockwise rotation uh, isomer. Um, and then this is the cis, this is the delta. Um, this is where we have a right-handed or right rotational isomer. Then draw the uh, geometrical isomers of the octahedral complex cobalt, or sorry, aqua, I swear. It would be amino, aqua, uh, bis, ethylene diamine, cobalt, three. So trans isomers, so that's where the, um, the, the identity ligands are opposite each other. We can have, um, however, two different types. We can have one where the water molecule is on the bottom and one where the water molecule is on the top, but actually these are just identical. It's not the same. Like you could just flip this over and it's, it's just exactly the same. Um, but we can have cis isomers where the two not the two monodentate ligands are beside each other. Um, and then this can, of course, um, be swapped over, uh, but that's not true as well. Um, but what we can have in the cis is we can have lambda and delta. So this is the delta isomer here, um, where we have a clockwise rotation. And this is the lambda isomer where we have an anti-clockwise rotation. Uh, and then we have the geometrical isomers of square planar and tetrahedral complexes. So first, the square planar, we have um, this one, this nickel complex. So this is uh, a dichloro um, di-trimethylphosphine nickel complex. So we can have trans isomers where the, the ligands are opposite each other. We can have this uh, where they're uh, beside each other. And then the tetrahedral complex we have here, what's this? Um, dicarbonyl uh, di-trimethylphosphine. Nickel. So only really one isomer here, because um, if you put the cobalt here, it's the same, uh, or sorry, the cobalt, the carbonyl here, it's going to be the same because they're still beside each other. Uh, there's really no isomerism there. The octahedral complex then here, which is the trichloro, uh, no, the triamino trichloro chromium. So that's going to have two isomers. So this is an, an MA3B3. So we have a facial where like they're all in the same face of the um, the metal. So, and we can have meridional where the ligands are on the meridian like so. So, then we have octahedral complexes where the chromium. Um, uh, this is a. Uh, complex has got a tridentate ligand. So it's um, diethylene diamine, basically. Um, so this one, um, again, it can still have, uh, it's still technically able to form the kind of MA3B3 because the, like, the ligand A3, for example, its three binding sites are all from the same molecule. So technically it can behave in that sort of A3. If we just assume that those ligands are actually just uh, binding sites like that A and B are just binding sites as opposed to um, anything else. Uh, so we've got FAC and MER for that as well. So same things apply. So we've got one where it's on all on the face and one where it's all on the meridian. Okay, all the isomers of octahedral uh, triglycinato nickel uh, two. So uh, here is the glycinato, GLY. Um, so it's got a nitrogen and an oxygen binding site. We have meridonial um, lambda. So this is anti-clockwise rotation. So it's meridonial because if you look, um, the binding sites of the same type, so nitrogen here, are all on the same plane. And here, the oxygens are all on the same plane. So it's meridonial, even though they're 
even though technically they're from different ligands, uh, because they're the same type of binding site, um, they are uh, capable of having this kind of isomerism. And then we have um, lambda, which means that we have anti-clockwise rotation. And then we have meridonial delta, where we have a clockwise rotation, same sort of thing. Uh, here, the nitrogens are all in the same plane. Here, the oxygens are all in the same plane. And then we have got facial um, lambda and facial delta. So the nitrogens are all in the same face. Oxygens are all in the same face. Um, and then we can see that this is anti-clockwise rotation. Uh, going from the nitrogen to the oxygen is an anti-clockwise rotation. And then here we have, again, same thing, face of the nitrogens and of the oxygens. So this is um, clockwise, like so. Uh, so what form of bisomerism might be present in this complex below? Um, so we have uh, waters of crystallization. We have uh, a chloride uh, counter ion. We have a chromium metal, which has four different types or three different types of ligands. We've got water ligands. We've got um, thiocyanate ligand. And we've got a, a chloro ligand. So we could have in instances where we swap um, the the thiocyanate for a chloro ligand out here, we could bring in more waters of crystallization, kick out more waters so the water, this water could go out and this chloride could come in, um, things like that. So we'll start off with geometrical isomerism. Uh, so we can have trans and cis, assuming we don't change the composition of the inner sphere. Um, we can have trans where like the, the ligands which are different are opposite each other. And then we can have cis for the ligands that are different or beside each other. Uh, we can have linkage isomerism where the sulfur and the nitrogen, uh, where the binding to the metal is through one, in one case through the sulfur and in the other case through the nitrogen. And we can have ionization um, isomerism where we, we change sort of like the, the chloride uh, in the outer sphere chloride becomes inner sphere here and the thiocyanate, which is inner sphere here becomes outer sphere there. Uh, hydration then obviously changing up um, the water. So there's many different ways that this can be done. Basically, because these uh, ligands are ionic, you can put them outside and put all of the waters inside. Um, you can remove more waters. Really though, the, the minimum number of water ligands that you can have is three, um, because there just aren't enough ions after that. Like, it just aren't enough ions after that to retain the optimal heat flow. 